So what's keeping you awake tonight? I have to admit, what's got me awake is a little bit of an existential crisis. Now, if you've been anywhere near a TV, a smartphone, or an internet connection anytime in the last about 72 hours or so, you saw the news that Jokar Zarnayev, the surviving brother who helped carry out the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013, was sentenced to die by the same jury that convicted him last month. Now, on Friday, I was at the TV station I worked for following along online to see what the decision would be and have really been dealing with a lot of mixed emotions since. Now, when massive tragedies like this occur, it becomes really easy to find some measure of empathy and sympathy with the people in those cities in which it occurs. But unless you're otherwise connected to that place through family or friends or even having once lived there, the level of outrage you feel is proportionally about a step removed away from those people who actually do live there. Now, for example, I can't even begin to imagine what it had to be like for people in New York City, both during and after 9-11, once they saw their city on fire. Nor can I directly relate to the residents of Oklahoma City and how they felt after the bombing occurred there in 1995. The reason is I've never been to either of those cities, so I know the outrage and fear that I felt as an American citizen, but that still puts me outside the much smaller sphere of the people who were directly affected by them. The Boston Marathon bombing, though, is an entirely different matter because even though I spent the last 25 years living in the Pacific Northwest, I was both born and raised in central Massachusetts and Boston was and remains the one city that I love most in the entire world. It's my city, and to not only see it attacked, but having that done during one of its greatest civic traditions absolutely horrified me. Now, being part of the media, I only not just followed the trial, but also the massive public outcry that ensued of people saying that Sarnayev shouldn't even have a trial and that we should just execute him without giving him due process, which is guaranteed under the Constitution. Now, it should be noted that before I became a journalist, I spent more than a decade working as a paralegal for a defense attorney. And in that time, I saw cases of a lot of people who did some truly truly despicable things. And if there's one thing I took away from that experience, it's this. When it comes to justice, we are a very, very bipolar populace. Either you believe in the concept that every person is innocent until they are proven guilty, or else the mere insinuation of guilt means that person is automatically guilty and is therefore deserving of the harshest possible punishment that can be applied without any possibility of leniency or any chance of rehabilitation. And more often than not, the only punishment that the mob mentality will accept is death. As I watched the news on Friday, I kept hearing my fellow journalists talk about how on social media, commenters kept saying how much they wanted the jury to stop going through all the legal mumbo jumbo and get right down to telling them exactly what they wanted to hear. And therein lies the problem. Now, if we're both a country of laws and dichotomously willing to use the death penalty as the ultimate form of punishment, it stands to reason that the fullest extent of the legal system is used at all times in its application. The reason why those 12 jurors went through the formality of explaining why they made their decision is because that decision has to hold up to complete and total legal scrutiny. They can't just give some arbitrary excuse for why they're gonna send somebody to die. Like it or not, that's not how our system of jurisprudence works. And as a result, you've seen a lot of states like Illinois, New Jersey, New York, abandon the death penalty because of mistakes that were made in how it was applied in their legal systems. But that doesn't mean I don't recognize what happened in Boston is a very, very extreme case. The facts speak for themselves. Three people were killed, 17 were horribly maimed, and more than 230 were injured. But having interacted with men who are presently spending the rest of their lives behind bars, I can tell you firsthand, it is far from what proponents of the death penalty make it out to be when they call it a lesser sentence. It also brings into question the notion and the myth that America is truly a, quote, forgiving society that gives everybody a second chance. Because the bottom line is, for all of our posturing, we're really not. And I don't say that just from the perspective of somebody who has worked in the legal system. I know that as someone who at one point in his life went through the legal system and was punished through the legal system. It has been 20 years since I last saw the inside of a prison cell, and from the time it took me to get from there to where I am now, I was told repeatedly that the world would be a whole lot better place if I didn't exist in it, 
rather than be given a chance to evolve into a better version of myself. But I'm also not naive enough to not recognize that it is much more complicated than just one case or the opinions of one human being. But if we have the capacity to condemn someone to death for being unrepentant in the brutality of their actions towards the other people, then we should have the same capacity to offer forgiveness for the people who are. And maybe someday we can be. But for now, it's late and I'm thinking it's time we get some sleep. Hopefully we'll have something better to talk about next time. Till then, sweet dreams when you get there.